Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm Professor Sayyid Ali Hazar. I'm honorary global, global professor of medicine without any name, fame or economics. And I am, am dealing with infection and disease for the last two to three months continuously with a gap of one week or one and a half weeks because uh, I have actually loaded up till now 200 and more than 250 videos and uh, most of the students or the people or fellows, friends, they have not watched it. It's your own interest. If they do not want, that's all right. But let's say the knowledge is enclosed in these uh, uh, presentations. I already said that the subject is dry and according to some of us it is a boring subject. And I have already said that in my answer that it is not a boring subject but it, it, this, is, this should be known to every person who is called himself a physician practicing physician or all those people who have learned medicine and adopt a specialty whether surgery or gynecology or stupidology whatever it is because this is a pretty infectious infectiology is the subject which should be known to everybody Continu continuing my spiral sheets session, spiral sheets are the spiral sheet gram negative bacteria. Some of the spiral sheets are difficult to stain, although, but they are classified under the heading of gram negative bacilli. They are not exactly bacilli, they are spiral sheet, that, that is why they are called spirosis. Sparrowsheets. Previously, I have already mentioned about the Tipanomas genus. I'm taking the another one, which is called Leptospirosis. Session one. Now, this is important to say that it was asked in 2000 and 2010 and 2017 in FCPS examination, in the theory examination, leptospirosis. Directly or indirectly it was asked. And most of the people at that time who were attempting, they missed this diagnosis because they have not seen these cases usually, although they should think about it, but they missed it usually. So it is in the sense that disease is present in your country, in your city and elsewhere nearby, it is present, because it is difficult to diagnose a difficult for a person that he had already making a differential diagnosis of a fever with a rash, for example, and he missed this diagnosis. Another point which I want to tell you that in one of the examination, when the former examination examiners were actually they were coming to take our examination of FCPS from Sri Lanka, from Malaysia, from Philippines, from Saudi Arabia, from England. One of the examiner who was who arrived from Egypt, he asked in the differential diagnosis of a case of a jaundice, the differential diagnosis. And he was prompting also a 
misdiagnosis or, or best, m- most least diagnosis also, prompting it. There are some, he said that some of the, you know, uh, diseases are which are not very common, but they cause these type of symptoms. What are they? The, the candidate didn't answer his questions. Then he said that this is the possibility of the doctor's viruses. Why not? Then the candidate agreed upon that he has missed this. In an FCBN examination, actually, forgiveness to a very minor thing is possible. But to forgive a major event or major diagnosis or a mistake, or which we have called a blunder mistake, because the fellowship is a big examination, afterwards there is no examination then they cannot be, it is not permitted and the candidate usually lost that chance. Be careful and listen to session one because it is a big subject. You have to understand every part of it. That is why I am stressing to you that you should understand bit by bit these videos and try to learn from the books the story a 18 year old boy developed fever with macular rashes seven days back when he visited the kadli jheel near the chatta he noticed that jaundice he noticed jaundice on the day 10th which was preceded by oliguria urine was high colored he also noticed the severe malaise and arthralgia afterwards and on examination the temperature was 103, pulse was 88 per minute, blood pressure was 90 by 60 and dehydration was positive, jaundice was positive, liver 1 cm tender, it is hepatomegaly and minimal splenomegaly. Hemoglobin was 9.5. The MCV was 75, it is normal. MCHC is 31. MCHC 26. It is also very near to the number. So it is the normal chronic normocytic type of anemia. TLC was 21,000 is higher. The typical size is 6% is higher. Neutrophil is 80 percent. The lympho size 16 percent, slightly lower down. Monocyte 2 percent, isonophil 2 percent. Total blood urban was 4.9, direct was 0.9. If you minus it from 4.9, it is 4. The indirect hyperbilirubinemia with ALT 62 it is not significant, significantly raised. EST 54 is normal. Alkaline phosphate 212, it is increased and G- gamma GT is 50, it is increased. Alkaline phosphate is 212. To me, it seems to be normal. Although the higher you know, level was given is 148 in the lab. To answer my question, that why ALP was increased in this case. This is a question which I have put on you. The gamma GT was 50 and CN creatinine is 1.9, urea was 76. It is higher, it is higher. Urine RE is 1.0340 specific gravity. It is high. Specific gravity is high. It is a concentrated urine. Urinoblinogen was positive, blood was positive, WBC was 4 per high, high power field, and RBC was seen numerous with bacteria snip. But this was the story which is enclosed here. The first question why there is normal chromic normocytic anemia in this patient? 
This is my first question. Secondly, why ALP is normal when the other total bilirubin, you know, or indirect is, is indirect hyperbilirubin is there? All enzymes are normal except alpha alkaline phosphatase. This is another, another question. And how will you interpret the urine RE in this case? If I talk on only this scenario, then it will take one hour. I don't want to discuss this scenario. But please keep it on the possibilities of what are there. For example, it is MCQ. What is the most probable diagnosis? 1, A, B, C, D, E. Put it like this. Now this is the first person who is enjoying the swimming in the cartilage heel. The story was enclosed. The knowledge is enclosed in the previous story which I have just told you. Now, coming to the introduction that leptospirosis is a blood-borne infection. It is not local, local infection, like yours or Pinta, etc. A beagle. It is caused by the bacteria spirochete, which is actually leptospirosis. It is a genus that can infect the humans, dogs, rodents, and many other wild and domestic animals. The organism is gram-negative spiral rod. So it is a gram-negative bacteria. And how you see in this microscope is this one, the spiral shape. If you magnify it, you see very clearly that the gram-negative spiral shape bacteria are seen in this slide. Microbiology, the leptospirosis is caused by the spiral sheet bacteria that belong to the genus Leptospira, which are an aerobic organism, right-handed helical shape, and 620 micrometer long. Like gram-negative bacteria, Leptospira have an outer membrane studded with the lipopolis acrylide on the surface, and the inner membrane and a layer of the pepti peptidoglycan, peptidoglycan cell wall. All essentialities of the protections are there for the membrane, the cell wall is concerned. However, unlike gram-negative bacteria, the peptidoglycan layer in the leptospira lies closer to the inner and the outer membrane. It is sandwiched, actually. This results in the fluid outer membrane loosely associated with the cell wall. In addition, the leptospira have a flagellum located in the periplasm associated with the corkscrew style movement. Corkscrew just like this. It helps in the penetration up to the inner region. <coughs> Chemo receptors at the pores of the bacteria sense various substrates and change the direction of its movement. The bacteria are traditionally visualized using the dark field microscopy without staining very clearly seen. If you apply dark field microscopy, you will find the bacteria's spiral shape movements are there with the help of the flagellum. The high power microfield. And this is the big, big, these are the bacteria. They are just like a bush, very, very, very thick bush. These are, these are the spiral shape. You know, movements are there inside one. And these, these, are, the, these are the lesion of the tissues. They want to penetrate it via the flagellum, corkscrew flagellum. Now what transmission is that the bacteria can be found in the ponds, in the rivers, the puddles, sewers, agriculture fields, and the moist soil. They need water. They need some soil, moss soil. Pathogenic leptospira have been found in the form of the aquatic biofilms, which may aid survival in the environment. They should have some of the 
portal to flourish. The number of the cases of the leptospirosis is directly related to the amount of the rainfall. We are to, nowadays they are rainfall, making the disease seasonal in the temperate climates and the year-round in tropical climates. In our country, the main holes, they are opened. The drainage system is very bad. And there are a lot of water is collected on the roads after the uh, rain. Even very, very, you know, small amount of the rain can accumulate a large amount of the water on the roads. The risk of contacting the trespasses depends upon the risk of the disease carriage in the community and the frequency of exposure. In the rural areas, farming and animal husbandry are the major risk factors for contacting the leptospirosis. Poor housing and inadequate sanitation also increase the risk of infection. Again, the, 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 the non-hygienic environment will cause the stasis of the water and they, they flourish in this water. In tropical and semi-tropical areas, the disease often becomes widespread after heavy rains. For example, in, in Dhaka, or nearby, in, in, in uh, what is called, uh, Bangladesh, and in Bombay areas, after heavy rains or after flooding. In Punjab, in our country, a lot of, you know, flooding are there, and the st static water will be there, they flourish the they are helping in the flourishing of these type of the bacteria. Humans are the accidental host. Accidental host of the leptospira. Humans become infected through contact with the water or the moisture that contains urine from the infected animals. Because these are the reservoir of infection. First of all, the animals are infected, they urinate it or defecate it and they and then the moist soil or the water, the stagnant water, will be the target for the infection of humans. That is, that is by their written accidental host. The bacteria enter through cuts, abrasions, ingestion of contaminated food, or contact with the mucous membrane of the body from the mouth, nose, and eyes. Occupations at the risk of the contracting the leptospirosis include farmers, fishermen, garbage collectors, and sewage workers. And I will, I will add the, those persons who make the stagnant water or the rainy, rainy stagnant water or swimming pool. The children are bathing frequently. You, you have seen in Karachi there are a lot of children who are taking bath in the stagnant water of the rain. The disease is also related to the adventure tourism and recreational activities, just like I've said, the picnic spots. Is among the water sports enthusiasts in specific areas, including the triathlons, water rafting, canoeing and swimming, as prolonged immersion in the water promote the entry of the bacteria to give chance to enter through the skin, slight invasion of the skin will invite the bacteria to enter. However, the leptospira are unlikely to penetrate the intact skin. If you are healthy, there is no invasion, there is no nothing, uh, skin, though there is no skin lesion previously, the chance is very less. The disease is not known to spread between humans to humans. And the bacterial dissemination in recovery period is extremely rare in humans. The bacteria disseminate in the in recovery period is extremely rare. If it is if you it, it is if the disease is uh, targeted and cured, it means cured. That's all. It will not recur. Once humans are infected, bacterial shedding from the kidney usually persists up to 60 days, and afterward there will be and uh, the humans they are safe to transmit this infection. It means cure is cure. That is the beauty of the medicine. When animals ingest the bacteria, they circulate in the bloodstream, then lodge themselves to the kidneys, through the glomerular and the peritubular cavity. The first of this, these are the important things. The first target organ which is involved 
after penetration, I am coming in the blood, and what is called lactosparinia, infect the kidneys, glomerular and the peritubular, per, uh, peritubular capillaries. The bacteria then pass into the lumens of the renal tubules and colonize the brush border and proximal convoluted tubule then the functionally the tubule will not work and anatomically they also uh, they they didn't perform activity or work. This causes the continuous shedding of the bacteria in the urine because the stasis is also the, uh, there in the proximal convoluted tubule. The flourish, flourish and flourish, this causes the continuous shedding of the bacteria and the urine without the animal experiencing significant ill effects. Although there is only urea or less urine is passed, that's all right. The person is okay, fine. This relationship between the animal and the bacteria is known as the commensal relationship. Because it, will, it is not infecting the body at this time. An animal is known as the reservoir host. Animal is a reservoir host. This is the pathogenesis which is explained in this diagram. The cut of the screen, breach in the skin, the the, uh, the spirochetes entering, viral the spirochetes, the entering through this, and the leptospirosis, uh, leptospira uh, will come here and they enter it and uh, to, to the cell wall because of the flagellum which is a cock screw shaped type, they penetrate the cell wall and they come inside and then the defense of the cell will activate and it will, there will be the, the erythrocyte will lies, you know, and this is a blood vessel which is seen, which is shown here and there, there is the hemolysis which is occur and again they also promote the other things as well, which is written that is the complement will be activated and plasmin gene will be converted into ad activate activate the plasmin. There are chances of afterwards of the of fibrinolysis are more there. And on the other hand, the clumping of the of the RBC will cause uh, the clot to form. Mm. And that is why there is there is a feedback mechanism is going on, negative feedback mechanism because the fibrinolysis will also degrade this clot, otherwise the patient will die. The activation of the caskets will, will form the clot formation, on the other hand, the plasminogen activates the plasmin and it will cause the degradation of the extracellular membrane. It will totally destroy the blood vessels and then come into the interstitial spaces afterwards. This is the pathogenesis is explained beautifully in this diagram. One, if one, if you, one, uh, one uh, of us wants to uh, gain knowledge about the disease, you can go through this diagram and you can understand it, how the pathogenesis of the leptospirosis is going on. Humans are the accidental dose, I already said. The pathogenesis of the electrospirosis remains poorly in the sport despite the research efforts. Exact pathogenesis they don't know. The end result they know. The target organs they affect they know. How they are achieving this inflammatory process, they are not clearly understood. This is not clearly understood. The bacteria enter the human body through either breaches in the skin or the mucous membrane into the bloodstream and then the leptospiremia occur. The bacteria later attach to the endothelial cells of the blood vessel and the extracellular matrix and complex network of proteins and carbohydrates present between the cell called extracellular matrix. The bacteria use their flagella for moving between the cell layers. They bind to the cells just like fibroblasts is defense mechanism, macrophages defense mechanism, endothelial cell defense mechanism. They, cut, they totally destroy it, they bind it and destroy it. The kidney epithelial cells also, they are defense mechanism. Again they are affected. They also bind to the several human proteins such as complement proteins, 
from interferon gene and plasma gene using surface lactospiral immunoglobulin like proteins such as LIGB and LIPL32 whose genes are found in all pathogenic species. It's not a specific. It is also seen in other gram-negative bacteria also. So, this was actually, they told you that this is a pathogenic mechanism which I have just told you. Story and introduction and microbiology transmission pathogenesis. I have just told you about this. That is para after entering into the interstitial spaces and through the bloodstream, they infect the liver also, they invade spaces between the hepatocytes, causing apop apoptosis. They shorten the life of the cells. So the liver cells are destroyed in the end. The damaged hepatocyte and the hepatocyte intercellular junction cause the cage of the bile into the bloodstream causing elevated levels of bilirubin resulting in the jaundice. On the one hand there is severe type of hemolysis and on the other hand if they stay in the liver they will cause the invasion of the hepatocyte and destroy it. First of all there will be indirect hyperlipidemia, then the mixed type of the hyperlipidemia. Contested liver sinusoidal and parasoidal species have been reported. Meanwhile, in the lungs, petechi and the frank bleeding can be found in the alveolar septum and the spaces between the alveoli. They erode it. The leptospira secrete toxins that cause mild to severe kidney failure or interstitial nephritis in the annual cause. The renal failure. The kidney failure can recur completely or lead to trophy and fibrosis. It depends when you interrupt this disease. Rarely the inflammation of the heart muscle can be occurred. Coronary arteries are, can be involved. And aorta, they are also involved. This is rare. Aortitis, for example, myocarditis or coronary arteritis is possible. But there are less chances. So this is the uh, part, session one, which I have told you, because the session is very prolonged. So you should understand, first of, first of all, you should understand that it is important to learn leptospirosis. Secondly, I have told you a story about it. And put you, put some question. Thirdly, I have told you the mode of transmission. The question again is to me, coming into mind is that, is it a zoonotic disease? It is zoonotic disease or not. Then I have told you that that the what, what are the reservoirs of infection. Then I have told you the mode of transmission inside the body. Then I have told you the pathophysiology and pathogenesis of the leptospirosis. Yet we are talking about the leptospirosis session one because the lecture is prolonged. I don't want that a long long lecture. Well, definitely you are not able to concentrate properly. I hope uh, my this this session will this session one will be uh, followed by session two, and you will also uh, watch this session one as well as session two, so that we can uh, proceed with the other uh, 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 pathogenic organisms, which are important, of course. وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغَ السَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ وَبَرَكَاتُهُ